Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends. Please uh, take a seat. The uh, afternoon session is going to start. And also, please uh, help us to close the door. Before we start the session, uh, would you please uh, take care of your mobile phones? And the, uh, uh, because as you know that this session is uh, world top level. The uh, energy dialogue. Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. It is the first time in the history for the Secretary General of OPEC, Executive Director, IEA, and IEF Secretary General, sit in a one panel after Secretary General of OPEC and myself join these two organizations. So uh, this afternoon, I know uh, many uh, friends have uh, more questions to be prepared. And for me, it's a good honor. I really appreciate the Dr. Pierce Organization Committee give me the chance to moderate this session. And also, I feel that it's a big challenge for me. The reason is, if I only ask very general questions, the audience you are not happy because you can read newspaper, you can watch TV. If I ask too direct and sharp questions and too sensitive, my two brothers after meeting will put me in the corner. You know what happens. <laughs> so that's, I'm in the middle. IEF as the intergovernment organization between the producer and consumers. I'm very neutral, very transparent, so I try my best. If my two brothers, they give the good answer of the questions, please you encourage them and give them a warm applause and then they will be happy. And then what will that happen after the meeting uh, on me? So uh, now maybe uh, we can start. Uh, I just mentioned that this panel is at the world top level. So we are different. Where we are different? We are different from start. I will ask my two brothers, everybody prepare one word, only one word. Write it down on the paper. I think my assistant put the paper there already with a pen. Summarize what they feel in the first part, year 2017, happens for energy industry, oil and gas industry, oil market, whatever. Only one word. They are the top level panelists. They are experienced panelists from the famous international organizations. So now I ask the both gentlemen prepare this word. And then everybody use less than five minutes. Give the explanations of this only one word. What the word covers, what he feels. And then after these five minutes, I will have questions. After all the questions, I will ask them, everybody give another one word to summarize and the outlook the second half, year 2017. And everybody used another two minutes, give explanations how they feel, how they all look, the future of the second half, year 2017 and later. If time still enough, maybe I open the floor for you, two or three questions. Of course, I expect very clever, very direct, very sharp questions, and then make this panel very successful. This is my plan. 
Now, maybe let's uh, start from my uh, brother Bakundo. And the uh, first, uh, you either like uh, to sit there or come here. Uh, uh, and then you give the uh, first words and give the explanation in five minutes, less than five minutes. After five minutes, you fail. <laughs> now, please. Yeah. Write it down, huh? It's a very long time I haven't sat in an examination room, <laughs> so you can, you can understand that. Uh, Only one word, huh? That's it. <laughs> this is a public examination, Dr. Yeah. Chen. Okay, so uh, now let's give the warm applause to uh, Mr. Bakendo to explain his uh, one word, please. Have I passed? Uh, have, have I passed the ex examination? Yeah, uh, depends on your explanation, five minutes. Okay. Yeah. So I'm still uh, on my way to passing this examination. Yeah. But uh, I think it would be inappropriate uh, to uh, begin this very important session with such very important and distinguished personalities in our midst, uh, like uh, my boss, Dr. Mohammed. Sada of Qatar, uh, the illustrious uh, president of the OPEC conference in the year of the Lord 2016, that explains uh, this word, challenges, challenges, challenges. Uh, and let me also thank uh, the WPC for an excellent uh, organization of this Congress. I think this Congress will go down in history as probably the most successful so far. And I think uh, the Americans in Texas, in Houston, they have a lot to learn from uh, Istanbul. Um, uh, I'm struggling to pass this public test by my twin brother, Dr. Sun. As he told you, both himself and mine were hired the same day, himself in Riyadh by the IEF and myself in Vienna by OPEC led by Dr. Mohammed Sada. So if I fail this exam, you should question him why he hired me. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, asking us uh, with my friend Fati to explain uh, the first six months of 2017 uh, in one word, it's itself a huge challenge. Uh, because uh, 2017 it came with high expectations after the historic declaration of cooperation on the 10th of December uh, in Vienna, where for the first time in history, uh, Dr. Sada was able to bring together 24 producing countries from both OPEC and non-OPEC under one roof, one umbrella, uh, shared goals and aspirations to enter into this historic uh, uh, decision. Uh, therefore, when we came into uh, the Q1 beginning from January, we came with very high expectations and the market could testify to that. And then we began to face headwinds, uh, some of them cyclical because of the traditionally low demand season of the first quarter of uh, every year uh, exhibited by the low refinery utilization, particularly in the OECD countries and in the biggest consuming country, the U United States. And of course, our friends in the financial markets who had also built up uh, positions, net lock positions, uh, to unsustainably high levels uh, based on the expectations of the declaration of cooperation, taking a very sharp correction uh, in the second quarter uh, of this year. So in a nutshell, I would say the fundamentals have changed. We have seen resurgence of supplies, particularly from non-OPEC, particularly from our friends in the United States, uh, an additional seven to 800,000 barrels a day of supplies coming from the US from uh, January to date, 
uh, in a cyclically uh, uh, low demand uh, season uh, with uh, activities in the financial markets that were also not uh, favorable uh, to, to oil. As a result of that, the stock drawdown that we uh, projected as a result of the withdrawal of a combined 1.8 million barrels a day, uh, 1.2 million from OPEC, about 600,000 from non-OPEC, uh, uh, did not lead uh, to a fast enough pace of stock drawdown. So we saw uh, a stock drawdown, but a slower, at a slower pace. Uh, 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 but we have seen a resurgence of supplies from non-OPEC, as I said. So the combination of that with the cyclically uh, lower demand season uh, uh, impacted heavily uh, on, the, on the oil market. Uh, hence uh, the world challenges. It's a very challenging first half of the year, uh, but uh, we are on course uh, go, going forward. Uh, we are remaining solid on our decisions on the implementation. Uh, you have seen the very high level of conformity by both OPEC and non-OPEC that is also unprecedented, uh, more than 100% of conformity uh, taking both groups uh, going forward. So I would like to pause here uh, to hear from my friend in Paris. Bonjour. Bonjour, monsieur. So, uh, it's a very good, yes, and now uh, let's come to our, uh, another brother. And the, uh, also, as you know that the uh, Fadi is uh, the, uh, before he's the uh, executive director, he's the chief economist of the uh, IEA, uh, very experienced. And uh, by his uh, the efforts, the uh, outlook of the, uh, the annual report uh, is uh, the, uh, very popular now. And uh, also, he uh, have a new report also uh, yesterday. So uh, now uh, we welcome him, and the one word, and they cover the first half year 2017. Yeah, please. So this is the third day of the, the conference, yeah. an excellent conference, and many thanks to uh, Mohammed uh, by labeling this uh, WPC as the uh, most successful WPC meetings uh, ever with respect to all the previous uh, WPCs. And I wanted to remind that uh, last year, Mohammed was also here for another major international energy meeting, World Energy Congress. This is the second meeting uh, in a row in, this, in my beautiful city of Istanbul. Now, this is the third day of the meeting, and uh, to be very frank with you, I had so many discussions, like all of us went to so many meetings. I am not very much going to be in line with your uh, disciplinary measures, uh, Dr. Sun. So I want to choose one number and one word. Okay. I will play, I speak a bit lightly. So it is, what I choose, the challenging is definitely something very, very well chosen by uh, Mohammed. Mine is called uh, Three Friends. Okay. Three Friends, in fact, you, you may think about the energy, oil, everything together, but it is in fact, a wonderful, there are some Turkish colleagues here they may know, wonderful Turkish movie made in 1960s, and the main actor was somebody who lost his life yesterday, Fikret Hakan. He was one of the uh, best players, actors in Turkey. He died yesterday, 83 years old, and I wanted to mention this movie, Three Friends. It is about the three men being very good uh, friends with different characters. But when you look closely, two of them, two of them are so that they have lots of thoughts, dreams, and uh, expectations in life. And the third one is the game spoiler, being very, very realistic. It's a wonderful movie. I, I suggest, uh, recommend you to look at it, especially Turkish ones, if you, Turkish colleagues, if you have the chance uh, to see it again. Coming back to the markets, I think first we have OPEC, the first friend, 
Second front, some of the non-OPEC countries having an idea, coming with a, a, a project. And the third front, who spoiled the game, was the markets. So uh, what we have seen is that the uh, many producing countries, well, OPEC members, some of the non-OPEC members had a project and which is uh, from their perspective a legitimate one. But as we said at that time, there are other market forces, such as the one when we said uh, at that time the A, US shale oil, and B, some of the projects which were already sanctioned before the price drop, which were about to bring oil to the markets, such as the one coming from, uh, or going to come from Brazil, Canada, and uh, elsewhere. So what we see at the end of the day, efforts are there from uh, OPEC members, some of the non-OPEC members, but there are market forces which are strong, which are stubborn, and as a result of that, uh, we are here today at the price levels uh, which are still not very far compared to when uh, three friends came together, discussed the issues, and two of them decided to go forward with the project. The prices didn't change, and uh, I don't know if it is the third friend to blame here, the market or not, but uh, I have seen that the uh, prices are still there where they were several uh, months ago. And what are the implications of that? The price levels, I guess we are going to discuss in the second half of the, uh, when we look at the second half of the year. Okay, so uh, thank you very much both. And I think uh, the uh, use of the one words or two words to give this uh, summaries of year 2017. And in the first part of the year is really challenging. And a lot of these uh, the difficulties and the uh, our joint efforts and work. And also a lot of the progresses. So uh, maybe my next uh, the question is to um, uh, Mr. Bakendo is, and the, uh, by the end of this month, and the, he's going to finish his uh, one first year work in, as a Secretary General of OPEC. And the, uh, so uh, i like to know uh, how he uh, enjoyed his uh, the, uh, work and job. Dr. Suna, I'm very careful with the, your choice of words. You said uh, enjoyment. Um, I can tell you that from 1st of August, when you and I assumed office uh, in both Riyadh and Vienna to date, I believe we have uh, uh, increased the number of our gray hair. And uh, Dr. Sada will also uh, confirm that uh, you are sincerely has lost a lot of weight uh, due to a number of uh, stressful factors. On a se more serious note, um, you and I came onto the scene at the height of this price cycle. Uh, which is uh, depending on who you talk to among the veterans uh, in this industry, like Franson, Harman, and co around, uh, whether it is the fifth or the sixth cycle, the consensus is that this cycle has been the most severe. Uh, it has also taken the longest than all the other cycles. In terms of the depth of the cycle, uh, it is also on record that the market had taken a lot of beating uh, with the prices plunging at one point by more than 80%. By the time uh, Dr. Sada convened his first meeting, I recall, in February of 2016 in Doha, uh, between himself and the Saudis and Venezuelans, I recall I saw you on, on CNN. I, I was a student then, watching you very admirably, your very brave efforts. Uh, in February, he convened this meeting to, in Doha, now called the Doha one, 
and then they moved on to Doha 2 in April, uh, where I saw firsthand uh, gathering nearly 20 producers, all in this collaborative effort uh, to address this severe cycle that had taken the market uh, like a storm. Uh, now, you and I came in August, already work is being done uh, from both sides, but I must say that uh, from the run up to Algiers, when we convene in Algiers on the 28th of September for, the, for your conference, ministerial conference, International Energy Forum Conference, uh, which gave us an opportunity. And here I have to also thank Dr. Sadas, president of the conference, who said, why don't we have a consultative meeting? All OPEC members are members of the IEF. Uh, so, Mohammed, why don't you arrange we have a... a IEF, you mean? IEF, not yeah. IEF, IEF, yeah. Yeah, 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 and, and you were there also. Thank God. Yes, we three so, so, all there. Yeah, so, so we, 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 I took the instruction from Dr. Sada and we, we talked to our Algerian friends who were very kind enough and gave us the opportunity and gave us a, a, a room to consult. And for the first time in history, we came out of that meeting and even our colleagues who were sitting outside waiting for the outcome were all shocked that this consultative meeting had turned into an extraordinary meeting that was not planned for, and with a historic decision for the first time since Oran in 2008 in Algeria, in another cycle, uh, demand-driven, we agreed uh, to cap uh, also in an innovative way, in a range, not one figure, but 32.5 to 33 million to take into account some extraordinary circumstances. Uh, and this journey kick-started uh, from there. It changed the atmosphere of the global markets. It changed the perception uh, of the global markets. It restored confidence, not only within OPEC, but also enabled us to reach out to our non-OPEC friends. Uh, and we moved like a train uh, to Vienna uh, on the 30th, if I recall, 30th of November, yes, uh, where we had the Vienna Agreement validating what we agreed upon in, uh, in, in Algiers, and also uh, strengthened ourselves in engaging our non-OPEC friends uh, who were then convinced that, yes, uh, OPEC is back. Uh, 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 OPEC that had gone through several funerals in the past again reinvented itself. Uh, therefore, uh, we were, some of us were really surprised to see 11 of them turned up on the 10th of December uh, in, in, in Vienna, despite the, the, the harsh winter. Uh, they all came and joined with us to reach this historic uh, decision termed the Declaration of Cooperation. Now, in my over 30 years engagement with OPEC, first as a delegate, later as a member of the Economic Commission Board for more than 15 years, and then as a governor in the Board of Governors, and in several capacities up to, I have never seen uh, uh, the level of activity uh, that I saw within this short period of time under the able leadership of Dr. Sada. Uh, I think uh, OPEC reinvented itself, we restored confidence, uh, we built bridges, uh, we restored uh, 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 unity and cohesion uh, within the group uh, through the extensive uh, diplomatic shuttles and contacts at all levels of our government uh, that saw us uh, uh, gallivanting across capitals around the world in most unprecedented uh, manner that you can think of. Therefore, uh, it's very difficult uh, uh, to, in a word or two, describe our experience in the last uh, one year. But it's a very rich experience, I must say. Uh, it's an experience that has paid off uh, and that we remain solidly on course uh, to achieving our chosen common objectives, not only in the interest of OPEC, but non-OPEC, as well as the global industry and the global economy.
Okay, so thank you very much for this sharing with your uh, one year's experience with this, because I know that uh, last year is not easy for OPEC and not easy for you. And that's the reason why I use the word, and how do you enjoy your new job as uh, the Secretary General of the OPEC? And then, brother is a brother. I didn't uh, tell him the why I use enjoy the word, and then he immediately smelled the meaning, yeah, so share with this, uh, this hardship and working. On his leadership, uh, I think uh, also by the uh, minister and the others' uh, support, I think very successful for uh, their work, and we can see that. Now I have another question uh, to uh, the uh, Fadi. Uh, the, uh, under his uh, leadership, and a lot of the new progress and already made for the uh, IEA also. And the, uh, uh, the, uh, two days ago, IEA the, uh, launched a, a new uh, energy uh, investment report. And yesterday he shared this with some of us, and then I'd like him to use uh, this report, give us a two, uh, only two, because if you open this subject, maybe a one hour uh, finish. So only two top the signals or informations uh, to us to share it with us, with the most important, he feel that, and then uh, uh, give us the sharing of this the report. Now, uh, Fadi, please. We went from uh, one to two now. Yeah. Going yeah. uh, now, first, let me acknowledge the uh, great efforts that uh, Mohammed did as a uh, new Secretary General of OPEC. Great diplomatic efforts. It is uh, one day he is in Baghdad, the other one is in Riyadh, the other one is in Caracas. It's a great effort. It's in addition to energy, uh, great diplomatic skills, uh, Mohammed. Congratulations uh, for that as well as to the, of course, uh, your uh, ministers. And it is, uh, as Mohammed said, it is not very common that the OPEC members and Russia and some other countries uh, come uh, together and to move together, and he was uh, definitely playing a key role there. And this is uh, unprecedented. But I am an engineer. I look at the, what is the result of so uh, result is discipline of the uh, countries and I think until recently our numbers show that OPEC discipline was very, very uh, solid. The new compliance numbers we are going to announce uh, tomorrow, uh, OPEC uh, uh, target compliance. Uh, but uh, as I said for me, important thing is where we are today in the markets compared to uh, several months ago. That's number one. Number two, I think it is to call uh, IEA consuming countries organization is completely wrong. Today, number one oil producer is a, a key member of the IEA, United States of America. When you look at the last five years, oil production growth from IEA member countries were higher than the oil production growth of OPEC member countries. So IEA member countries brought more oil to the markets than the OPEC members. United States, Canada, Norway, in terms of gas, Australia, many countries were uh, responsible for it, and soon to be uh, Mexico. So therefore, the the very old distinction between OPEC for producers, IEA for consumers is passé. It is over. If you are still looking at it, you, either you are not looking at the numbers carefully or uh, you need to update yourself. Number three, what are the three numbers? What are two numbers you ask me, uh, Dr. Sun? The first one is about investments. Investment is very, very, very important. And we have been saying since a long time, like my friend uh, uh, Mohammed and many of the uh, oil industry uh, leaders, we have announced 2015 and 2016 global oil investments each year declined by 25%. So 15, 16, two years, and in two years of time, global oil investments were halved. 
It is incredible. We have never seen this history. So everybody was waiting for our number. Whether or not 2017, we will see a rebound of the oil investments. And we, as Dr. Sun mentioned, we published our number yesterday, 2017 numbers. The first six months are uh, the uh, data of this year and the next six months and based on the company plans and projects. And the news is 15 decline, 16 decline, and 17 is flat. No strong rebound we see in 2017. Having said that, if you dive the numbers, you see a two-speed oil market in terms of investments. Investment in 2017 in Russia, Middle East, Africa, and Latin America is more or less flat or just a bit weak declining. And investment in U.S. shale oil is increasing more than 50%. Okay? So 50% increase in U.S. shale oil investments in 2017 vis-a-vis -vis flat or weakening outside of the uh, uh, U.S. This is a two-speed oil market with a lot of implications. This is number one. Number two is uh, we talk a lot on uh, uh, oil. Let me move to electricity. Almost 100 years, oil and gas investments were the majority of the global energy investments. When I say oil and gas investments, upstream, midstream, downstream, everything put together. And for the first time last year, investment in the electricity sector took over that of oil and gas put together. It's for the first time, electricity investments. This also gives us an idea a bit where the money is going to and uh, what kind of investment opportunities are there, even though, as we say at the IEA, if we don't see the investments rebound in the oil sector in the next years to come, 2020s may be a very, very challenging period in terms of supply meeting the demand, and we may well have unpleasant surprises in terms of uh, oil market balances. So these are the two numbers. One is on the oil uh, uh, investments. They are 17 is globally flat, but two different pictures, U.S. shale oil versus the others. Second, electricity investments for the first time since 100 years overtook the investments in the oil and gas sectors uh, combined. Okay, thank you very much for this, uh, uh, the uh, sharing of these uh, two important uh, information. So by this one and the uh, uh, last year for the Shell investment uh, uh, over 51% uh, increase. So this is uh, very important uh, information. So my next question to the uh, Mr. Bakendo is, and the, uh, for the American Shell oil, in the past uh, a few years, uh, I have a lot of uh, de uh, development. And the, uh, on one hand, OPEC and not OPEC, the agreement try to uh, reduce, uh, uh, freeze the production. However, the American uh, shale oil increased. Yeah. And the, uh, how do you like this American oil? And how you feel that this American shale oil sustainable or not? Again, um, I underline you are very carefully chosen words. Whether I like the American shale oil uh, I, think, I think it's on, on record that OPEC as an organization does not necessarily see uh, the shell industry as an extraneous component of the oil industry. Uh, sh the shell revolution, if you like to call it, in the U.S. played a very critical role in meeting uh, demand at a time when the energy landscape was facing uh, severe difficulties, particularly in some 
of the major uh, producing countries, be it in the Islamic Republic of Iran, be it in Libya, or in my native country, Nigeria, uh, uh, the, the world was facing severe uh, potential shortages uh, of oil uh, due to these difficulties in these major producing countries. And the Shell Revolution uh, midwived by the fracking technology as well as uh, uh, the innovative uh, industrial as well as managerial skills uh, of the industry in the U.S. was able to step in uh, to minimize, if not address the issue of this potential shortage. So uh, we should not forget the role that this part of our industry played uh, in ensuring security of supply and ensuring uh, stability uh, in the market. Bringing fast, fast, fast tracking forward, uh, the current cycle that we are struggling uh, to overcome is a supply driven cycle. And the supplies coming uh, from both sides, but particularly from the non OPEC, in the Q4 of last year, uh, by the time we took the historic declaration of cooperation on the 10th of December. We were already carrying with us additional supplies from non-OPEC, particularly from our shell uh, 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 producing companies, uh, about 1.8 million barrels a day, additional supplies uh, uh, coming into uh, the, Q, the Q1. And therefore, it had also played another role in not only uh, uh, worsening the supply uh, imbalances, but also the gloomy, uh, depressed state of the market beginning uh, in Q1. And because we do understand in OPEC that we all belong to this same industry, we now reached out for the first time. Uh, we went out of our way to meet with our colleagues in this uh, important industry in the United States uh, and had uh, kick-started uh, this dialogue with them in order principally to understand ourselves. Uh, we must admit that both of us probably had limited knowledge of each other. They are operating in a very short cycle uh, project uh, sector of the industry whereas we are in the long cycle, uh, but we all belong to the same market. Secondly, we thought that it was very important for us to reach some understanding that we all have a shared responsibility to ensuring stability in this market. Because at the end of the day, when we first met in Houston uh, with all the leading uh, producers uh, from the Shell Basins, we realized that we were all impacted by this cycle in very negative numbers. Uh, they opened up to us to uh, share with us the financial stresses uh, that their companies uh, were struggling to contend with. And we agreed that going forward, there is need for us to uh, be conscious of our responsibility uh, to ensure stability in this market. It's a shared responsibility that requires shared and joint action. Uh, so it is business, uh, it is work in progress, and uh, we intend uh, to deepen these discussions uh, uh, with them. Both our conference of ministers and other orgas in OPEC are all aligned that we have to uh, continue uh, this energy dialogue with this very important sector of our industry. Okay, so thank you very much. Maybe another uh, question for uh, uh, Mr. Fatih. Uh, the uh, United States pulled out from the uh, Paris Agreement, and the, uh, this one has a lot of discussions. So uh, how do you feel that the impact 
and for this uh, the uh, agreement and also for the uh, climate change and also the energy transition. Um, climate change and other environmental issues are very closely linked to uh, energy. But I want to uh, remind all of us that energy is something very good for our lives, for our economy, for our social lives, uh, for our uh, modern lives and everything. So we don't have any problem with energy, we have problem with emissions. There are two different things. I wanted to make sure that energy is a positive thing, uh, first of all. Second, however, when you look at the history, global emissions, CO2 emissions, carbon emissions, increase each year since several decades if the global economy increased. So there was no single year when the emissions did not increase if we saw an increase in the global economy. Until last three years, as IEA has announced, last three years, global emissions were flat even though the global economy increased significantly. For 2016, global emissions were flat, zero growth, even though global economy increased more than 3%. It's a very good news. But what is behind that fact? What happened? When you look at the numbers, the country which reduced the emissions the most last year, 2016, it was the United States. It is mainly shale gas replacing coal and making more use of renewable energies, wind and solar power. So therefore, we have to first look, uh, talk about the numbers. Looking at the future, climate change remains to be one of the key challenges for all of us. But I expect that the uh, United States will continue to try to push the emissions down by using more natural gas and making more use of other clean energy technologies, including renewables, nuclear power, and maybe carbon capture and uh, storage. So climate change is important strategically important challenge for all of us, and we should uh, look at the numbers. We need US, we need Europe, we need China, we need India, all of the countries to be part of the solution. Very good, thank you. And uh, for this one, and, uh, we need the uh, United States to join us, and the uh, great country, and important for leadership, for technology, and uh, for the finance. Okay, so I have another question for the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, back and door. As we know that by the July 24th, the uh, Russian oil minister, Mr. Novak, invited uh, some of the oil ministers to go to St. Petersburg. And uh, also uh, some of these, uh, the uh, other countries. So uh, by this effort, and yesterday the oil prices the up a little bit, and because the uh, Minister Novak talked about that, if necessary, and the, uh, the, the considered uh, even for extension and deep and wider uh, of this uh, further agreement for production. So maybe uh, Mr. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, Bagendo can share some information with this. Now please. One of the innovative mechanisms of the declaration of cooperation that was entered into between ourselves and the non-OPEC in December was to establish uh, the Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee between OPEC and non-OPEC uh, to monitor the implementation uh, of this uh, uh, decision. I say innovative because for the first time in our history, uh, we are agreeing with the non-OPEC uh, to set aside uh, sovereign issues and form this joint committee, not only at the technical level, but also at ministerial level, 
uh, to jointly monitor uh, the implementation uh, in the most transparent manner uh, based on the principles of fairness and equity. Uh, and uh, this committee uh, has been meeting uh, once every two months, uh, and in itself it has also established a technical subcommittee uh, that assists it in its uh, monitoring and uh, compliance uh, responsibilities. Uh, this committee uh, will convene in St. Petersburg, as you heard from Minister Alexander Novak, who is the co-chair uh, of the committee, uh, uh, together with uh, uh, Isam al Marzouk of Kuwait, uh, and they are inviting members of this committee to meet on the 24th of uh, July. Uh, during our last conference on the 25th of uh, May in Vienna, uh, this committee's mandate was expanded uh, by the ministerial committee uh, to go beyond the routine monitoring of the implementation of the decision uh, to also begin to critically look at the impact of the implementation on market conditions, and thirdly, also to make appropriate recommendations on how to uh, respond uh, to these uh, market conditions. Uh, so for the first time in uh, St. Petersburg, we're going to have uh, uh, probably a more uh, robust uh, uh, meeting of this committee with its expanded uh, role as agreed upon on the uh, 25th of May. Uh, uh, be that as it may, uh, both the OPEC and the non-OPEC side, as you might have heard from pronouncements by ministers, uh, were very satisfied with the work of the GMMC as well as the JTC. It has worked perfectly well so far, uh, and uh, we intend to uh, proceed uh, through this mechanism uh, for the rest of the uh, implementation phase. Okay, thank you very much for sharing, Lisa, the... Uh uh, the uh, progress of information first. And the, uh, I have another question for the uh, Fatih. And the, uh, recently, a lot of discussions uh, on different uh, the, uh, workshops. And the original people have a lot of the uh, OPIC discussions about the supply. And also for this uh, uh, non-renewable uh, energies of uh, oil and gas, and even uh, we need to control the production and the consumption and leave for some of the, of the uh, future generations. Now this issue after technology is not, is not there. But another issue, uh, the oil pick for the consumption come. And the, as an expert, and the, uh, so my question to uh, Fadi is uh, how do you feel that the, the oil pick for the consumption come? You mean the oil consumption? Or? Yes. Okay. So uh, we think uh, oil uh, demand will uh, continue to go, but I should make a one change. You said IEA is uh, experts in oil consumption, but we are also experts in oil supply as a production as well, just to make it uh, known. Now, going to the consumption, uh, we think uh, that the oil demand will continue to grow in the next years to come, unlike some others who believe that oil demand will peak and go down. Some people say because of what is happening in electric cars, we are going to see the end of oil uh, sometime soon and the demand will go down. We do not agree with that for the following reason. While colleagues say that the uh, electric cars are changing the old entire game based on a number, which is a very important number, last year electric car sales across the world reached a record. Last year, we have now, as of last year, 31st of December, we have two million electric cars in the streets of the world now. It's a big number. But at the same time, not a big number. Because electric car sales last year were less than 1% of the all car sales. So 99 cars were traditional cars, internal combustion engines, and one car was electric car. And I asked my colleagues, Let's assume for the next 20 years, not one out of 100 cars were electric cars sold,
But every second car sold was an electric car, and the other one is a, 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 a conversion. What happens? They told me, even it is the case, not one out of 100, but 50 out of 100, or every second car was electric car, global oil demand will continue to grow. Because, ladies and gentlemen, unlike the, the, the debate going on, different circles, oil demand growth is not coming from cars. It is coming from trucks, number one. Number two, ships. Number two, jets. And number four, petrochemical industry. We should look at the numbers before being completely enthusiastic with the annual electric car sales. It is, of course, happening. It will happen more in the future. But we believe oil demand will continue to grow. It will grow maybe a bit slower than in the past, but it will continue to grow. Therefore, therefore, we still need investments. We need, still need supply. We still need the oil of OPEC, non-OPEC countries, US, Brazil, Mexico, elsewhere. Otherwise, we will be in difficulty. So we do not have the right to mislead the discussion by looking at uh, the, the electric car sales and saying that we are at the end of the oil uh, era. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe I can ask you all your figure. In the first half of year 2017, how many cars sold in China? Anyone in those? Yeah. Okay, so please, there's a gentleman there. 10 million. 10 million, yes. In general, right. Do you know the 10 million, uh, the small number there? 10.8 million cars in the first six months, year 2017 in China. And also second half of year, even more than that. Your answer correct. So by this one, you see the consumption uh, will continue. I share my uh, friends, uh, colleague, uh, the, uh, the uh, comments. Now I have the uh, last question to both of them. Uh, as you know that, IEF, uh, NOPAC, we three, uh, the uh, organizations uh, work together. And uh, according to the charter, IEF, the IEA and the OPEC are the observation organizations of IEF. So that's the, the, the legal uh, uh, requirements for these uh, two, uh, three organizations working together. So my question is, IEA, IEF, OPEC, and the trilateral relationship and the cooperation, how can we further improve it? Now, I like the, uh, my uh, the, uh, brother, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, for the uh, bureau, maybe the, uh, this time to uh, answer the question. Have we improved? Yeah. I think we are doing a good job anyways. We are yeah. working here. We are three of us together. Okay. Let's continue like this. It's a very good job. Uh, as you said, uh, we are uh, brothers. Yes. Maybe in the future, there will be three sisters here, so this is, uh, we, we yeah. will see that. <laughs> but it's good to work uh, together. Okay, very good. So, uh, the, uh, the, uh, Bagot, no, please. Uh, the International Energy Forum, uh, midwife by, partly by OPEC and the IEA, I think has uh, come to stay. It's a success story. Uh, we must pay tribute uh, to the uh, founding fathers of the IEF to bring both the producer and the consumer dialogue that has started uh, much earlier into an institutionalized form uh, under the umbrella uh, of the forum. Uh, the forum has achieved so much in, uh, uh, in this regard. Uh, now, we, this year, we met for the seventh time in Riyadh, I recall, uh, with the IEA and ourselves uh, and other stakeholders to compare our outlooks short, medium, and long term, to compare our methodologies, our baselines, our projections. And uh, you can see that in between those sessions, we also have a very active program, uh, both uh, in, in Paris uh, with the IEA and in Vienna, uh, looking at the impact of the financial markets on fiscal oil, looking at the impact of renewables, particularly coal substitution, and, and so on. And uh, I, I must also admit, since your uh, assumption of office uh, in August, I think you have brought uh, a new vibrancy 
uh, and a new a, a new phase uh, to 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 the IAEF. You have increased the outreach and the advocacy, uh, bringing both IEA, OPEC, and all other stakeholders under the umbrella of the IEF. I think this is part of the vision uh, of uh, King Abdullah uh, of blessed memory of Saudi Arabia, uh, who initiated this uh, uh, project. Uh, and I think going forward, as uh, Fatih has said, we have to build on uh, what we have achieved so far. Uh, I think the global energy industry uh, needs the IEF to continue to strengthen itself and its reach out and uh, increase its level of programs uh, to go beyond just the two institutions, uh, but to the global community. I say congratulations to you. Okay, thank you very much. For this one, we'll continue. As I mentioned that we have a joint outlook together. We have the uh, financial and the uh, fiscal uh, meetings uh, in Vienna, much, and also we have the uh, only guest, the uh, uh, co meeting uh, with the uh, IEA and also Judy Data and others. So we'll continue this. And now, my fi the, the final words is as I, I told you before, and I would like to invite the two gentlemen, everybody give another one word for the outlook of uh, the second half, year 2017. So uh, maybe uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, back no, first this time. And how you see that the second half of the year, and the, uh, so, yeah, okay, and uh, he's a very optimism. Okay, so maybe uh, you give me the explanation to all of our audience. Uh, thank you, Professor. Two two minutes, huh? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Soon. You know, professors are always professors. Yeah. Uh, they like to subject everybody to their classroom. Uh, rules, culture, and tradition, and, and I, I, I like this innovation. Yeah. Uh, this is also, I think, one of the takeaways from the Istanbul. So that's the reason why we three are different from others. Yes, uh, Istanbul, the Istanbul WPC is uh, unique in different forms, and I think uh, your, your, your style is also one of the takeaways for, for Houston. Uh, 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 I, yes, I say optimism, uh, and, and, and I think, uh, uh, Dr. Sada will agree with me that we remain optimistic that uh, we are on the course to achieving our common goals with the non-OPEC, our common objectives that we agreed upon, that in order to bring balance to this market uh, that had eluded us since 2014, we must jointly address one variable in the equation. And this variable is the variable of stocks uh, that had been impacted by another variable, which is supply. Uh, we have seen stock levels uh, at one point when you and I assumed office in August of last year, rising to record levels of over 380 million barrels over the five-year average. This was totally unprecedented, triggered by supply, and we agreed both within OPEC and with the non-OPEC that this equation, if it must be addressed, bring the equation back to balance, this variable has to be addressed. And in order to address this variable, we agreed to jointly withdraw 1.8 million barrels a day uh, from the market uh, together with our non-OPEC, we implemented this uh, in the first six months of the year where, as I said earlier, we have faced huge challenges going forward and uh, we decided to further extend it for another nine months. The results have been encouraging uh, despite these huge challenges. From January to date, uh, in addressing this variable, we have seen uh, drawdown of stocks of over 100 million barrels uh, from this overhang just in the first six months of this year. Uh, so going forward, we expect the drawdown to gather more steam as demand uh, begins to pick up in the second half. Uh, 
bringing back uh, this equation into balance by bringing the variable of stocks to the uh, five-year average. So in a word, we remain very optimistic and we remain committed and determined uh, to uh, pursue our common objectives in the interest of all producers and the global economy. Okay, thank you. We uh, like to see that you're optimistic uh, and in the uh, second half of the year. Huh? So, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Fadi, maybe uh, you uh, summary, please. Yeah. So, I don't have a... I, I have a title, okay, but I will give the title at the end, but very briefly, because uh, we are uh, running late. I will first give the explanation. It will be a very, very, very difficult six months for the oil industry. Uh, for uh, producers on the OPEC side, non-OPEC side, uh, uh, lots of questions for the uh, consumers, and very ch uh, perhaps the challenging was the word uh, that uh, OPEC used. I would call, uh, the title I would give is, I started with a movie, I finished with a song that I like. Some of you uh, may remember whose age is like mine, from Rolling Stones, Riding on the Storm. So it will be a Riding on the Storm, in the next six months for the uh, oil industry, not easy six months. Finished. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And the, uh, so the both of them are happy. And the uh, one is uh, the optimism. Another one is uh, like uh, the uh, uh, rock and dance. And they are, they are happy. So uh, the, uh, this afternoon time uh, this, uh, is up. So uh, we cannot open this uh, for your questions. And uh, I uh, like you to join me to give uh, both of them these uh, warm applause to thank them for these uh, excellent <laughs> questions and answers. ARCHIX is a collaboration project uh, involving six universities, four research institutes and eight oil companies in Norway. And our aim and goal is to understand the petroleum resources of the Arctic, uh, how to develop the best possible technology that suits the Arctic, which has the least possible environmental impact. The research is mainly uh, divided into three. So three intertwined projects. One is to understand the Arctic geology, we're dealing with uh, petroleum geology and exploration of the Barents Shelf, so of course, geology is a very crucial and important component. I've been working with several different projects and different aspects of, uh, of sedimentation in, in uh, Svalbard and the Barents Sea. But particularly, I've been focusing on the paleogene succession that were deposited 60 million years ago in uh, what they call the central basin of uh, Spitsbergen. So I think this basin is a good analog to some of the basins that you find uh, along the western Barnes Shelf margin. Here you can see there's a layer in the rocks that is a bit darker here. And across the fault you see that this block here has gone down on the other side of the fault. Here you have a layer of sediments here that is thicker where the fault has moved down. So you had some space to deposit more sediments. Of course when it comes to exploration, uh, Having Svalbard as an uplifted part of the subsurface is very important because then we can use this as an analog to the stratigraphy that the companies are working with in the, in the southern part of the Barents Sea. The other one is to understand the environmental impact of our activities. We operate with ecosystem-based management in the, this region of the world and that means it's a balance of protecting the environment but also utilizing the resources that exist there and that is a big challenge because you have to bring all the stakeholders to the table you have to communicate the risks and you have to come up with solutions and manage the future development activities the final component is a focus on marine mammals because marine mammals are you know, at the top of the food web in the Arctic. They're very much associated with sea ice, so we spend a lot, we have a very strong focus on marine mammals uh, in the program. 
marine ecology is an important part of uh, ArcX because um, we want to work sustainable and uh, we need to understand the ecosystem. In case something happens, then we need to understand which um, consequences it can have for the ecosystem. And the third is to develop the best possible eco-friendly technology that is suitable in these vulnerable areas. We are taking part in other projects that use new technology to collect data and analyze data. So of course that's the link between kind of old school conventional geology being out in the field is easily combined with uh, new technology. We also uh, do some technology projects where we develop uh, drone technology for use in these areas uh, and that requires special uh, infrastructure. I use drones or unmanned aerial vehicles to look at um, marine mammals, uh, more specifically whales. They fly in uh, using waypoints uh, following a set path that we design in a computer with the help of Norut. And then every three or four seconds they take a picture. And then I look to see if there is a whale there or not and look at the quality of that picture to see how certain I am and what are the light conditions. It's essentially is to test how, how good these tools are because uh, the use of these systems is, is quite recent and it's been developing really fast. So um, having this for marine mammals, it removes almost completely having the observation that you collect at sea and then goes away that nobody else can look at that. So you, then you have a recording that several people can, can see and uh, you can remove what's so-called uh, the observer bias. The biggest resource we have in a program like this is the group of young people. We have a number of PhD students and postdocs based at universities, but they are also coupled to institutes. What I'll be doing is that I'll, I will investigate the source rock uh, properties of a uh, specific period, the Triassic period, and also next year we plan to go to Svalbard uh, and collect samples there as well. So I'll also be collecting samples in Bernal. And we will correlate that with wells which have been, which have been drilled in the Barents Sea. And we can see how these properties of the source rock uh, changes laterally. And then we can try to determine how the um, quality of the source rock is in terms of uh, hydrocarbon potential. We conduct many um field expeditions and, and research uh, expeditions uh, and we uh, it could be close by or it could be uh, trips that require the use of ships and the University of Tromsø has a research vessel that we use for that and then we have access to very good laboratories at several of the participating universities but also industry partners help us with their laboratories. So all in all, it's a, it's a complicated mix of different infrastructure that helps us to conduct the research and give the best possible results back to the participants. I don't know any other project which brings all of these activities in, together into one project like this. Uh, and also the sheer volume and size of this project is such that we will have an impact. It's an eight-year uh, project in involving many partners. The cooperation between the academia, uh, the government, and the companies as uh, as cooperators is is very unique in a, a region a setting, at least. Uh, and the, the size of the project and the diversity is also very unique. It's a continuous process of improving the way we do things as new knowledge comes to the table. By getting the communication going, we can actually we also get good information back from authorities that we can use to improve our research uh, programs. The ultimate delivery, I think, uh, is that we would have been very useful for uh, uh, the authorities, uh, for the oil companies, and for the research institutions and universities who are involved in the project. Uh, we will have educated about 30 PhD students and trained postdocs, uh, and we will have published uh, a set of good papers in the best journals. Thank you.